Um, I mean, it's it's probably not the it's probably not the end of the world if we don't get somebody to take notes because we have a recording. But I'd I'd rather you know rather have somebody to take minutes. I agree with you there. Doing a quick scan to make sure that everybody. Um, so that was my next question was, uh, and actually that's a question for you, Eric. Do we do blue sheets for the uh, virtual interims? We do. We do indeed. So uh, then, yes, Spencer, we are. We are going to do blue sheets in the etherpad. Um, somebody who's got the. Had. URL in their cut buffer needs to share it again because people who've joined since don't have it. Yeah, I uh, oh, uh, hold on, give me a second. <laughs> oh, yeah, Spencer just sent it out. So, Spencer just sent out uh, a different one than Eric sent out. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, uh, I don't see, I don't understand why. <laughs> just the one yeah. coming from Data Tracker. Well, I'm, oh, there is one in the data tracker. Okay, I was looking for one and didn't see one. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, let's take one or the other and put a redirect. Put the one. Take the one out of the data tracker. Okay. So I'm going to move everything over. Fortunately, fortunately, somebody's been busy in the other one. I think Eric's been busy in the other one. So. Cool. I think that link probably works good for you. Suggest to use the one without any TCP port. That's easier for the firewall. And typically, using the the port nine thousand nine caused problems in previous interims. So let's stick to the one I pasted, um, simply because it's uh, plain HTTPS. So there we go. Um, so now that we've muddled our way through this, I can take notes if you want. Be delightful. Awesome. Please do in the uh, in the in the Etherpad. Um, now that everybody has gone to the Etherpad to um, sign in, we know that everybody can find the Etherpad and um, can help with the notes. Um, at the very least, keep an eye on it and make sure that um, anything you say or are that you say is represented properly and uh, otherwise help with clarification. All right, with that, I'm Leslie Daigle, co-chair of the MOPS Working Group. Kyle? I'm Kyle Rose, co-chair of the MOPS Working Group. So thanks, everybody, for coming to our virtual interim. Sorry that we were not able to get together in person in Vancouver, but I'm not sorry about a lot of things these days. Um, okay. So um, for those of you who may or may not be familiar with uh, how we do Interims. Um, there is a Jabber channel. It's on that I know is posted on our um, starter page, and there is an Ethernet pad, an Etherpad, as uh, Eric has shared with us, which is where the notes are being written in real time. Feel free to jump in and help with those, and please do sign in, um, sharing your name and affiliation, so that we'll have a record of who was actually at this meeting um, for future planning purposes. Um, yeah, I'll, well, I'll uh, monitor the I'll monitor the Jabber channel as well as the the queue in the chat. Uh, right. we, uh, so a, a little bit of logistics here. Uh, if you want to get in the queue to speak, um, just uh, basically in the chat, type plus Q to add yourself or minus Q to remove yourself. Um, and if uh, if you're not speaking, please keep your mic muted so we can reduce background noise. Great. Thank you. Uh, and I think you need to make me a presenter in order to be able to. Just can I ask see if I can figure that out. Go ahead. Please ask me a question. Sorry, who was just speaking? Um, 
somebody was asking a question and then didn't get a chance to ask it. Yep, sorry. I was asking, where would you like the notes written? Do you want me to write them? In the Etherpad. Okay. That's all right, because it, it just then people can see it in real time and, and help if there's any clarifications. Okay, sure. Um, yes. Oh, you were going to make you me present presenter something. now. Okay. My many, many applications and pick the one I want to share and accidentally share. Unfortunate. All right. So, um, if I've done this correctly, you should be seeing. Um, version of the agenda on screen. Apologies for effects. We're there. Awesome. We can see it. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, just so um, unless there's any any bashes to the agenda and I'll pause for substance. Hey, Leslie, this is Sanjay. Just a quick question on uh, folks that are in the meeting and have a question. Um, how do you want to handle that? That's what, um, um, yeah, do just, you want just, folks to use the chat? Yeah, use the chat. And as Kyle was saying, use plus Q to get in the queue and minus Q to get out of it. Is there, Got it. Sorry, I, I, I must have missed that. Um, and if, if there's anyone for whom that doesn't work, speak up and we'll figure out something else. Um, moving right along then. Um, Jake, you are up. And if I do this, is it Ashley and Kyle, do you have the note well to show? Okay. It's mandatory. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'm the bookkeeper here. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, and, and a good if you, uh, if you Google for it, it's, uh, it'll show up somewhere. <laughs> Briefly, so that I can actually find the note well. About that little fluff. It is disturbing not to have the usual settings. That's okay. We're still working out the kinks on our processes. It's, uh, you know, we'll get there. Back here. Thanks for catching that, Kirk. So this is an IETF meeting. So IETF policies are in effect. Um, so for various topics such as patents or code of conduct. Um, so I'm sure you're all reading this on the screen as, as we're sitting here, um, but just by way of reminder that you agree to follow ITF processes and policies. And if you are aware that any IETF contribution is covered by patents or patent applications that are owned or controlled by you or your sponsor, you must disclose that fact or not participate in the discussion. Um, yeah, and as a participant or a, in, in or attendee to any IETF activity, you acknowledge that written audio, video, and photographic records of meetings may be made public, um, that your personal information provided to the IETF will be handled in accordance with the IETF privacy statement, um, and that you agree to work respectfully with other participants um, with a pointer to the ombuds team should you have need of it. Um, I think that's a fair representation of the note well. Eric, if that scratches the itch. Move on to Jake. Great, thank um, you for taking that. I think we have a Glenn Dean in the queue, according to the chat. Kyle, it's up to you. 
took himself out. Perfect. Okay. Wait a minute. Uh, no, Glenn removed himself from the queue. Okay. We could go to, yeah. All right. Um, I don't get to forward these, right? I just ask for uh, next one. I think that's right. All right. Uh, so I'm Jake Holland. Um, I'm presenting about the uh, the current working group draft that we have uh, and the updates since our last meeting. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so um, there's been a few changes in kind of draft status and things around the draft. Uh, and to summarize these. The draft was adopted as a working group draft uh, on the mailing list. Uh, we renamed it. Uh, two co-authors joined, Spencer and Ali. I'm very grateful to them. I think they're really going to get us over the hump into a definitely useful document. Um, and uh, I, I am uh, very pleased with their contributions and glad to have them on board. Uh, we added an acknowledgment section and uh, made a, a try at capturing all the comments from the mic last time uh, and from, I think it already had um, the comments I, I recall from any uh, uh, email discussion. So if you've made a contribution and you don't, and we have, and I haven't, and I've missed you, uh, then be, please be sure to let me know. I think, I think we're caught up on the list of, uh, of acknowledgements so far um that have been incorporated into the document uh, at its current draft um we added a sorry go ahead sorry, sorry um kyle are you typing somebody's typing in there Not muted. no but i will uh, i'll mute whoever's typing sorry Thanks. Thanks. um for basically reviewers and and uh, potential con contributors to um, kind of give them a, a pointers to the right places to engage. And we got the repo moved to a, uh, a working group owned repository. So uh, thanks to the chairs for getting that set up. Uh, this is its current location. Um, so go there if you're looking for it uh, or for the uh, for the working document of it. And there's a pointer to that in the draft also. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so there's a, a few bits of you know, content that the draft will be about itself that also we've been, that we've gotten started with, uh, mostly my co-authors, thanks to them. Um, and uh, just a few, uh, you know, helpful additions getting us in the right direction on what the document text should end up talking about. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have a list of issues. So these are mostly in the uh, issue tracker. I think there might be one or two in, in TBDs in the text of the draft still. Um, and where I want to spend most of my time on the uh, on this update is that there's a, a great suggestion from Spencer, I thought. Um, and please do take a look at the issues list, uh, add issues. I think we had one contribution uh, already from um, was it? I think it was Matt. Uh, and that's much appreciated. We'll be taking a look at that and incorporating it. Um, but uh, Spencer had a great idea. And uh, so I'll, I'll talk about the, the very next thing that we're probably going to rev the draft for and put something out. And that is the uh, template on the next slide here. That's the, that's the feedback that we're specifically soliciting in addition to any sort of issues you want to raise. So go ahead to the next slide, please. So we're going to add a section to the draft, we're thinking, and it's going to look something like this. And we're looking for feedback on this part, plus um, you know, contributions from those of you who uh, are interested enough in media operations that you're <laughs> attending this meeting, plus any friends you might have. Um, so the, the idea is that we, we would like to collect a catalog of the issues that people know about in the community, uh, p things you've encountered before, things that you, um, uh, you know, obviously we'll be filling out a few of these from, from our own experience, but we think we can reach a broader audience. 
or we think that there's things that we don't know about probably uh, that people that other people uh, who are taking a look at this do know about that we can probably incorporate. They're asking for a name, a reference to something describing the issue, even like a you know pointer to a mailing list uh, comment about it if that's the best place where it got um, where it got explained. Like that is really helpful for just kind of understanding the background. Um, a description of what the issue is about and uh, its impact, um, you know, where it happens in the network, who can see it happening, uh, and uh, just some idea of how much we know about its prevalence, um, any incidents that you might know about. Uh, we're also asking for a list of the mitigation techniques. Uh, so now, the mitigation techniques I want to go over a little bit as well, because the um, uh, it's possibly out of scope for the current motivation section described by the current draft. So there's a few different things that we might be doing with these mitigation techniques, and it kind of depends what the contributions end up looking like. Um, but one possibility would be to collect them into a, a section uh, that's about mitigations and kind of expand the scope of the draft. Um, another would be to, uh, to turn it into another document. So we want to make sure that we have a list of these that we're maintaining. Uh, it might be in the, uh, in the mitigations for now and then in a mitigation section of the draft for now, and then move to a separate document uh, a little bit later when we're when we're kind of ready to to make a division. But um, the idea here is that uh, uh, we want to um, right now the the document is supposed to be collecting mostly informational things to be aware of, but we would like also to consider how best to present the the best known ways to address them and to turn it into uh, perhaps a BCP that makes actual recommendations or perhaps an informational document that just sort of lays out the things that people have brought up in a way that can be sort of easily consumed by people who, who might benefit from knowing these things. Um, so uh, that is the template that we're asking for. And uh, yeah, sorry. I, Suddenly, I'm getting a bunch of messages. Uh, I'm not sure if you hear my dinging going off. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that's it. And uh, any comments or questions? All right, uh, Matt, un unmute yourself and go ahead. Let's see if this works. Can everybody hear me OK? Yep. All right, perfect. So. Uh, Thanks. I, I actually think that the template, uh, I, I think it's a it's a good idea with a document like this. It's, you know, it, it can end up being an encyclopedia, right? So I, I my first reaction is if we're targeting this towards people who understand the video domain, but perhaps don't understand the network domain as well, and it's intended to be a survey, um, I, I would think uh, talking about the challenges, but then referencing, especially when you start getting into mitigation techniques uh, in detail, uh, referencing other documents or best practices in other places is probably best because otherwise this could get both out of hand and stale very quickly. So that I guess I guess that's my my uh, uh, you know reaction to the to the comment. But I do but I do like the way that you know this template is 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 trying to shore that up a bit. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, uh, another thing I probably should have mentioned. Um, one one of the possibilities here is to if we collect the mitigation techniques to turn them into. Perhaps if there's enough of it, if it turns into really a, a large encyclopedia, then maybe it would be uh, multiple separate documents that could be BCPs directed toward different audiences. I th we think that's a, a pretty good way to collect it. So um, that's one of the ideas on the table. I think that you know 
it kind of depends what the contributions end up looking like. But yeah, that's the direction we're thinking of. And thank you for that feedback. We'll uh, uh, we'll certainly uh, take a good look at it, try to incorporate it. Uh, Spencer, thank you. Spencer, go ahead. And traditionally, I would unmute before I started talking, right? Um, so, um, what, what we were thinking there um, early on was basically just to say, uh, we're doing more than just to say, you know, this is a list of bad things that can happen. So, it was important to me to have, have the stuff that we were collecting be actionable at some level. Um, even if to say, you know, it's like, I mean, like a couple of things we've got in there already. It's like, well, that's the way TCP works. You know, so, <laughs> you know, you, you know, even being able to give people uh, an answer saying, if this is what you're seeing, you know, there may not be a really great mitigation right now. But for, it was important to me to, for these things to be as actionable as we could make them. And so that's that's kind of why I was uh, starting to talk about collecting the mitigations there. And I I think that the suggestion to collect pointers is a is a really good one um, because uh, you use the word encyclopedic, and I think that's exactly the right thing that uh, I was afraid of, which was basically here's a list of sad tales from the uh, video streaming community and uh, not really, you know, not really actionable or anything like that. So, I think I think that I think that that's a, a definitely a good a good suggestion. And we didn't want to emphasize this is the proposed template. So, uh, we are happy to listen to uh, people explain to us what we could be doing better as well. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good answer. And the you know I'd like to mention that. Even if the answer is like, well, that's the way TCP works, so we don't have another solution right now, you know, maybe that's nonetheless a good hint that, well, you could consider going and looking at quick, or maybe, you know, next year we could consider looking at SRT, depending what you're what you're doing. Like if if TCP is the problem, that points in the direction of useful solutions, right? So knowing that is is half the battle. Yeah. Right. All right. The uh, the chair recognizes Glenn. Yeah, hey, so I wanted to follow up on the comment Spencer just made. Um, I think that collecting mitigations is really good. Uh, so, so, you know, plus one on them doing that. Um, although I don't want to, I don't think we should cast them as sort of like, well, here's a mitigation and problem solved. You know, sort of just like as Jake commented, um, I think maybe where there's issues we get called out and, and we sort of can say, sorry, we can say, well, here's a mitigation that sort of starts alleviating the problem. However, there may be better solutions and bigger solutions that are necessary. Um, and, and maybe you know, this is sort of a farming exercise as well to collect requirements that could get turned into uh, problem statements uh, and future documents within both MOPS and, and beyond the IT, or beyond MOPS in the ITF. Uh, in particular, you know, if it's things like, well, that's just how TCP works, that's a really good indicator that maybe there's something we need to revisit architecturally someplace else. Maybe it's, you know, like Jake said, maybe it's look at quick SRT. Uh, maybe it's a need for something new that isn't around today. Uh, you know, because everything to do with video, you know, happens to the internet at scale. So one little bad thing, um, maybe locally, uh, kind of escalates very quickly into being a very bad thing across the board for a lot of people. So. My two cents. All right, uh, Matt. Yeah, just a, a follow up. I, I think that the other thing to that I'm that I'm thinking about when we're talking about mitigations is that I, I um, it makes it, and I, maybe this is kind of along the lines of what Glenn was saying, is that it's it's not really black and white because. It often, and I think everybody will, will resonate with this, it's actually what are the trade-offs and what are you finding acceptable? And so uh, the reason I'm, I'm thinking about this is as I was, the section that I kind of put in as a something that might be worth putting in the document 
is about personalization and advertising and how that impacts things like cacheability and network utilization and all of those other things. And and it's more of a, hey, you know, video person, the choices that you make have these downstream effects and, you know, you should be aware of them. It's not that, oh, personalization or advertising is bad or can, shouldn't happen or whatever. That's, that's not my judgment. But, you know, the, it's that, that if they're aware of it, then they can make better decisions about how it impacts the infrastructure, what resources they might need, and so on. So I, I, I think that having that kind of veneer in the document that gives them the tools to dig in, use the right nomenclature to potentially find the solution that fits their their need is 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 kind of where I'm going. But I, I like the idea of having, you know, some of the options listed. I, I, I the the pointer comment was really just you know, we, we've got, to, we're probably going to have to be a little judicious to make sure that we, you know, it doesn't turn into too much of a book, but I, I don't want to give the impression that I, that we shouldn't have answers in here if we, if we can put them. So I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Um, thanks for that, for that input, Matt. I'm conscious of the time and I think that we should probably move on unless there are other issues here. What I would, um, what I would suggest is, why don't we try collecting some issues and see what we get? And then we can figure out how big a problem or, or a smaller problem we actually have. Works for me. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Matt, Spencer, Glenn. Uh, maybe I'll send a quick follow-up to the list. I thought I heard one suggestion in there that might result in a template change. Like, maybe we should ask about trade-offs or something. But yeah, that was uh, uh, between Glenn and, and Matt. We'll, we'll think about that a little bit and move on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both for that. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, next up we have my cat who wants to come and say hello, and but I'll mute shortly. And um, Sanjay, you're up as soon as I get the slides going. All right. All right, looks like I'm good to go here. Um, I see the slides up there. Um, my name is Sanjay Mishra and uh, I'm from Verizon, but at the moment speaking with the uh, streaming video alliance head on um, and of course Verizon is a member of member company um, so um, this presentation is a little bit uh, outside of some of the things that, that I've spoken in the past um, in the prior uh, MOPS meeting uh, focus has been on one of the working groups the open caching working group um, and how that had ties back into the uh, CDNI working group um, both ways, um, something um, that got picked up from there and something that got added to the working group. Um, but uh, but I thought maybe um, to try and um, broader the conversation because stick, sticking with open caching working group leaves a lot of conversation out uh, on what are the important work that is going on in the Alliance. Uh, so I actually had reached out to Jason Thibault from Streaming Video Alliance, and um, and he graciously offered his help to share the great work that is going on within the Alliance. So I'm going to be talking through some of that here. Um, slide two, please. Um, just uh, as a quick recap, um, and I apologize for those that are already familiar with it, but just wanted to um, give a quick view here. Um, so SDA is really, it's, it's a collaborative ecosystem comprising of content publishers, content distributors, and the network service providers and technology vendors uh, to work on over the top streaming media delivery. Um, and within SDA, member companies share common vision of making streaming media provide a consistent experience to an end user from glass to glass. Um, this minimally needs understanding of issues 
uh, around content creation, packaging, underlying media protocols and transport protocols, uh, network behavior, and the end user player. So lots of different uh, pieces that, that actually go into this. So, so there's, there's, there's points of interest in, in each of these areas. Um, and as, as an outcome, for the most part, Alliance will uh, produce guidelines and best practices. Um, but, but also, uh, at times, the Alliance would do run the trials and write specifications uh, and conduct interoperability testing. Uh, so, of course, uh, there's heavy reliance on IETF for the protocols and, um, and interoperability, but the 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 also opportunity there's also an opportunity to bring back to the IETF uh, some of the work that we do and some other things that um, we think would benefit uh, IETF. Uh, please move to slide three. Um, so I uh, just wanted to take a quick moment here to highlight a few things before we get into some of the specific projects within the SBA. Um, so the recent months have had a profound impact globally, um, but then as with any challenge, there also is an opportunity, and, and there surely is a COVID-19 effect globally where we all have learned to live in a virtual world, uh, including this meeting here, which unfortunately is not in person. Um, and, and obviously, there are some tidbits of relevancy also from uh, the streaming media point of view. Um, what COVID-19 has brought upon us is, uh, is, a, is a pretty heavy usage of the network in many different uh, areas, uh, even including the voice calls, uh, but leaving those aside, uh, from our purposes here, um, some of the numbers just to kind of sh uh, share, um, Comcast has reported a video surge in their network somewhere about 38%. Um, and a peak traffic of about 32%. Um, AT&T reported something similar with 28% jump in core network traffic, um, and, and that the video traffic was, was about half of the traffic on their mobile network, uh, pretty significant. Um, and also, uh, not to be left out, Verizon reported similar numbers where their video traffic was up by 36%, um, and also, uh, AT and T, like AT and T, they also have reported uh, surge in social media platforms as well. So, from what, what is relevant uh, above is that streaming video is already a significant part of the network traffic, but on top, events such as COVID-19 cast a big effect on the network capacity. So, while network providers do plan for spikes and scale their networks, um, but the higher order point here is that. Um, really, no one um, entity uh, in the OTT video delivery food chain of its own can deliver or be as effective uh, when solving for issues such as scaling and latency. Uh, so really the question is, is there a room for improvement? Um, next slide, please. Uh, yes, there is room for improvement. Um, so, um, for example, um, just to highlight some of the, the work that is ongoing in, in other working groups, um, the live streaming working group and also virtual reality study group, um, there are a few initiatives that are uh, looking into the opportunities to measure uh, latency and, and see uh, where that can be improved. Um, so, one of the projects so of the three that are listed here, um, the first one is, is best practices document basically for looking at the uh, latency uh, glass to glass from the encoder to screen. Uh, this project is holistically looking at the end-to-end -end workflow, uh, examining points of weaknesses um, right from um, the uh, distribution encoder uh, to the uh, encoders and down through the whole video delivery chain, uh, looking at um, where there's opportunity to tweak and tween, uh, and tune. So, so that that is, uh, and the outcome would really be a, a best practices document uh, from that effort. Uh, 
Um, the other on the VR study group, um, basically member companies are looking to uh, run some live VOD, uh, uh, live and VOD traffic for VR360 content uh, on the live network, uh, and then measure end-to-end -end performance. So, um, and the VR study group is also working with the VR industry forum uh, to jointly run these tests and then publish results. Um, and then the, the third one is the initiative, very similar to VR study group, which will focus on collecting measurements and along with the workflow, uh, identifying the points that needs to be tweaked or have been tweaked, uh, and then uh, publish best practices and, um, and the results. So there's potentially a possibility that some of that work may result into uh, identifying areas um, that might need some help in IETF. So uh, there might be some internet draft that may uh, eventually come uh, through that uh, studies. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so wanted to give a little bit of a view on some of the potential work um, that is also being considered within the Alliance. Um, there's much more definition that has to be done in terms of the specificity uh, that needs to be looked at. But broadly, uh, some of the work includes um, something that, uh, one is TCP stack optimization. Uh, I know this is something that is very um, keenly done in IETF already. But the, the intent is to, to look at, um, again, to the TCV stack and look at what might be the opportunities here for uh, uh, some tweaks, again, uh, looking at the video delivery and, um, and seeing where might be some of the, the pain points. Uh, so this work will obviously require some close coordination eventually with the IETF as well if, if there are areas that, that seems like worth looking at. Um, and then as we have seen with the, with the COVID-19, uh, scalability is a major consideration. Uh, and what also is needed is basically, uh, how about smartly using the existing network resources as opposed to uh, throwing more money infinitely into just growing the, the network. Uh, you can only go so much. Uh, so I think the, the, the important part is to how do you smartly use the existing network resources? Um, and then um, another project that being uh, closely looked at is um, uh, content prepositioning uh, for in-home storage. Um, the, traditionally, the set-top boxes have played a big role um, and they already act as a smart hub uh, for recording um, broadcast TV uh, primarily and of course the TV guide, et cetera. But uh, there's there's a lot of lot of room here for storage, and potentially um, any content that can be offloaded and being kept close to the devices, um, and even prepositioning of the content closer to the devices, closer to the end user, um, has some opportunities. So there are member companies that are interested in pursuing uh, in-home storage as one of the potential um, working group items. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this one talks about uh, some potential new working groups as well. Um, so the uh, one of the activities that the Open Caching Working Group has done as uh, being relying heavily on CDNI, uh, some of the work has been done. But uh, in addition, um, the uh, group, the alliance is also looking at uh, additional additional work around the CDN interoperability. So more has to be defined here, but uh, primarily um, uh, some of the work that um, that has already been done in CDNI, but really not implemented. So there are some, some feedback um, that members are interested in bringing back. So as, as that work really uh, gets defined, um, CDNI, CDNI interoperability is one area that uh, the work is going to be looked at uh, within within the uh, within this work group. The other item is um, also 
challenges that are, that are across the um, a myriad of video players that you have on the end of the devices. Um, and um, the, the issue is that they all, video players don't behave the same way. Um, so sometimes they uh, necessarily don't have a stickiness to the uh, redirected source. Uh, so this then causes the inconsistency in the uh, player, in the video player experience. So potentially uh, there's some opportunity to look at um, um, what can be done to sort of improve and have best practices around um, video players uh, that can support uh, different OSs, different uh, devices that have a uniform uh, experience. So those are the at least two working groups that are being considered um, to be established uh, in coming weeks and, um, and months, probably. Uh, with that said, I think this is probably the last slide that I have. Um, right, Leslie, I think this is the last one. Yeah, so this is the last slide. Uh, with that said, um, thanks very much. And um, Leslie, back to you and for any questions. Anyone, one, any questions for Sanjay? Yeah, yeah, hi, Leslie. There's a couple of us in the queue. Kyle. All right, we're not hearing Kyle. Um, I am not entirely sure. All right, Glenn, I think you're first. So we have Glenn, Jake, and Spencer right now in the queue, by the way. Um, so hey, um, so the other thing I'd like to add uh, to Sanjay's uh, great great um, presentation um, is that uh, I, I think this sort of got dropped through the cracks at the SBA uh, when Sanjay and JT were making up the, the slides. Um, there's also work that has started up very recently within the networking transfer group of the SBA uh, that has started to look at use cases around um, both edge computing as well as multicast use cases uh, in, 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 in somewhat in non-traditional um, areas uh, of a multicast usage. You know, this would be beyond uh, a lot of people have looked at things like delivering to the client by multicast or um, cache population by multicast. So what I anticipate um, we might be able to also add in uh, to what Sanjay talked about is a uh, down the road uh, to do a crossover where we bring forward uh, some um, media use cases for stream, multi, multicast streaming uh, to the ITF. And I think this would fold nicely with the um, other work Jake has done uh, on the multicast um, stuff. Yes. Did we lose? Did we lose you, Glenn? That was Glenn. Uh, I th I thought he finished. I was done. Sorry, it's sorry. Sorry. It sound like it. <laughs> it's hard for people to walk away from the microphone when there's no microphone. <laughs> uh, well, thanks, Sanjay, and and thanks also, Glenn. That's an interesting addition to Sanjay's update. Uh, um, I, I thought uh, this this looked like really interesting work. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about how. Uh, what does that engagement look like, do you think? Will this be like uh, SBA members uh, commenting on the ITF mailing lists in the sort of uh, best fit they can find uh, where the where the uh, you know where where you want to have the tight engagement with IETF? Because I know that um, at least with regards to uh, a few folks, um, there the differences are. Uh, considerations between the SDA and and the ITF contributions was part of the reason that uh, that there's not like a hundred percent overlap in the membership. Um, so yeah, just I guess that's most of what I wanted to ask, and I'll have to think about the multicast insight. I'll, I'll be very interested to hear more about that too. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good question, Jake. Um, so what I think, especially with multicast, is, is something that I know um, 
SPA is looking at and um, something that is that work is being also done here. Um, what what as, as as individuals, what we can do is um, bring back the updates um, into the IETF and, and more importantly, not only just the updates, um, there, there's going to be uh, questions and things, you know, which IETF is, you know, has either looked at or would be interested in looking at. So we can always bring uh, the, the the problem statement um, and, and, in fact, bring it back to this working, this very working group, um, that this is a specific problem which is really well and beyond the scope of um, something that can be resolved in SBA, but that's something that maybe IETF can look at. So, so I think the, the important part would be is for, for us from the SBA standpoint, define a very clear problem, um, do some research, and then uh, bring the appropriate problem statement and, and any references that that can point to what work has been done. And if, if there were something that was missing, then you know, kind of try to spell that out that um, here's the problem statement, here's what I think has been done, but looks like there's some room for improvement. So if, if we can bring that type of uh, messaging back into the IETF, I think then there's, there's, there's clearly a room for where IETF can really look at it and, and work. Uh, and SBA can consume uh, what comes out of the IETF in terms of companies adopting the, you know, implementation or adopting the draft. Great, thank you. Yes, Very you're faintly. faint. Yeah, it's like maybe you've a computer on board mic as opposed to your own board mic. Let me figure this out. Can you uh, can you just handle this for for a few minutes, Leslie? Spencer, was yeah, I uh, I just wanted to thank Sanjay for. Uh, for for uh, the for the update on uh, the COVID nineteen effect on uh, that's something that uh, the author team on uh, the streaming considerations draft had been talking about wanting to add that uh, you know pointers to that for the section on uh, unpredictable traffic uh, patterns and uh, like I say we really appreciate the update on that. I was wondering the same thing when I was going through the slides. Um, Glenn, you're next. Hi, so hey, switch to a different mic. Maybe this will work better so you can see me when I walk away. Um, hey, I wanted to address uh, the concern Jake had over um, potential IP conflicts between the two groups. Um, so I think when the uh, documents get done over the SVA, uh, the tradition there is to publish them onto the web for anybody to read without signing any required IPR agreements. Uh, the IPR over there really pertains to members of the Alliance who uh, potentially would uh, you know, adopt or implement things that in standards the Alliance would produce. But things like use cases, other stuff like that, even best practices get published um, onto the internet. And that way, the when they're done, the ITF membership can just take a look at them and, and we can use them over here in MOPS without any concern. So I think we're good to go uh, on that regard. And if we have a problem, somebody should see me because I'll see, do what I can to fix it. I'm on the board over there. Thank you. All right, uh, can you hear me now? Well. Sorry? We can hear you well. Excellent, excellent. All right, anyone else? Any uh, further questions for Sanjay? Not, I guess we'll move on to the next talk. Thank you. And um, so next up, something completely different. Uh, we have the secure routing trans transport SRT. Um, so Max Starbaiko, if you take the floor, I will share your slides. Yes, thank you. Try to share your slides. Hi everyone, thank you for offering this time slot. My name is Maxim Shurabaiko. I'm senior software developer at High Vision. Together with SK Telecom, we've prepared and submitted the draft specific SRT protocol recently. 
I did a presentation of SRT at the dispatch session to discuss how SRT can fit into IETF workflows. And today I would like to do an overview of the protocol features that could potentially be useful for MOPS use cases. Next slide, please. So what is SRT? SRT stands for Secure Reliable Transport. It is a protocol built on top of UDP. It is content agnostic. It provides bidirectional data transmission with automatic repeat requests, forward error correction, and bonded connections. It also supports three multiplexing, so several connections can be established over a single UDP socket. Next slide, please. SRT offers several operation modes, message mode, live mode, and buffer mode. Message mode can be used to transmit messages that span over several packets. Live mode is a subset of message mode with additional features to enable real-time live stream delivery. The third mode is called the buffer mode. It is used to open a connection, transmit a single and large piece of data, then close the connection. Next slide. So with the described operation modes, SRT can cover a number of use cases. This slide presents a list of cases when SRT can be used. The major use case of SRT is live video contribution and distribution. SRT offers mechanisms of latency management, backend retransmission, and so on. And it is content agnostic, so usually SRT transmits MPEG-TS, RTP, or elementary streams in its payload. Another use case is transferring files and segmented streaming formats like HLS and DASH. In this case, SRT ensures every packet is delivered to the receiver as efficient as possible. And uh, does it, SRT doesn't control the end-to-end -end latency because real-time delivery is not required in this case. The third potential use case of SRT is uh, tunneling. Again, SRT is agnostic to the content. It uh, transmits um, and therefore it can tunnel TCP packets, HTTP requests and responses and almost any other type of payloads. Message exchange is uh, one more use case. Exchange and some metadata, control data, uh, custom voice comments, and so on. Next slide. So, as I've already mentioned, the major purpose of uh, SRT is low latency live video contribution and distribution in live operation mode. In this mode, SRT provides a constant end to end latency uh, that includes network transmission latency and a configurable buffering delay of the receiver. The buffering delay is used to retransmit lost packets. Those packets that failed to be recovered within the given latency are dropped in favor of following packets to enable real-time live streaming. Next slide. Before going deeper into the overview of SRT features, I would like to share some motivation why uh, one should consider using SRT. SRT was created and first used in 2013. In 2017, SRT was made open source and free for public usage. At the moment, SRT is one of the most widely used protocols for live contribution and distribution. Last year, SRT received the Technical Emmy Awards. Uh, companies using SRT are joining the SRT Alliance that currently counts more than 350 members. And only last year, more than 100 new companies had joined SRT Alliance. This slide presents the latest survey on the video transport protocols usage conducted recently by uh, High Vision. It can be seen that SRT holds a decent part. Uh, as the amount of live video distributed over the public network uh, increases, the relevance and application of SRT has grown enormously. Still, without any doubt, there are alternative protocols and solutions that can be used as well, each having its advantages and disadvantages. Therefore, I would like to go through SRT features to highlight uh, what is available in SRT out of the box and what is not available. Next slide, please. This slide presents a matrix of SRT features uh, that address the most common tasks and issues associated with live streaming. The first set of tasks is connectivity. Connectivity, connecting uh, two peers together to exchange data without using a third party is often very tricky. Modern day networks use NATs and firewalls. While SRT offers a firewall traversal mechanism, it lacks NAT traversal. We are interested in uh, integrating it with uh, interactive connectivity establishment, if it makes sense. Connection migration and network switching uh, are features that also could potentially be added in the future. To distinguish multiplex streams, SRT already operates with connection IDs, which could be used to perform these kinds of switching. 
Next set of tasks is access control. Consider a client who wants to connect to a streaming server and request a certain resource. The streaming server needs to authenticate the clients, probably share the stream definition of the requested resource, and start sending the data. SRT currently supports this use case, except for the stream definition functionality, which is more or less available, but not yet fully defined. Our current vision is to use uh, the stream definition protocol for this purpose. The next thing is security. Once a connection is established, content can be transmitted over a public network so that anyone can access it. SRT offers IS encryption of the payload of data packets. A pre-shared password is used with the password-based key derivation mechanism to establish an encrypted connection. Other automated key distribution methods could potentially be adopted in the future. The fourth threat is content delivery. Like any lossy network, the public internet suffers from packet losses, packet reordering, jitter, and a variant end-to-end -end latency. Packet losses introduce artifacts in the video. The variant end-to-end -end latency may cause unstable playback speed, freezes, and so on. Some lost packets may not be retransmitted in time. They have to be dropped to enable real-time streaming. All of this has a major impact on the quality of experience. SRT addresses these problems. Also, SRT is trying to do congestion control, flow control, and be network friendly. Live streaming does not permit many options here because of the defined input rate. But an SRT center can make decisions to drop packets if it thinks the network is congested, thus at least not causing more cross-traffic congestion. But uh, there is much room for improvement here. The final point of interest is utilizing several networks, for example, to duplicate all the data and improve delivery or to balance the load between the available links and increase the throughput, or handle periods of congestion on certain links. So this set of features is a work in progress. Starting functionality will, will be added in the upcoming uh, release of SRT. So, um, next slide, please. And that was uh, an overview of what SRT can offer. Thank you for attention, and feel free to ask questions. I will be glad to answer. Any questions? I think there was already a discussion about this proposal on dispatch and you got feedback from uh, Eric Rescola and other people involved in security, Quick, and other protocol. Can you sum up where the, what's the status of those discussions are? So based on this discussion, we decided that um, SRT should start with an informational track to submit to what we already have and uh, to have a solid a specification of it and uh, based on this specification we can move on and understand in which groups uh, it can be used in which groups it can be uh, useful for uh, for application i kind of remember some pushback from the security as, uh, expert on the security aspect and from a lot of people that would have to so, uh, on, on proposal I'm not sure who's not following the queue. I'm sorry. So um, my name is Alex. I'm part of uh, different groups. And uh, I was following that discussion on dispatch. And I saw the, the people uh, that are involved in the, the quick discussion and the RCRP and proposing that this would be more discussed in the media transport group than a MOPS. But I didn't follow recently. So I were, since I don't see a slide to see what the feedback of IETF was already. I wanted to see what the situation was. Okay, so why don't we take that a little later in the queue? Because for right now, I think we're focused on the fact that A, we in the SRT presentation, and in part because we're still trying to hash out what are the um, media implications um, and, and things that we should learn from the SRT experience for media handling in general. So, uh, as I said, can we take that uh, a little bit later and back to you, Kyle, for managing the queue? Uh, yeah, that sounds good. Um, Jake, I think you're up next. Can I have, sorry, a quick note on that. Uh, Leslie, could you please open the previous slides? So uh, security is one of the points that the SRT offers. Uh, sorry. I, I get that, and we'll get to discussing it, but for right now, we're... Yeah, we're thanks. Going okay. Jake? Uh, great. Uh, so I also am going to be interested in that discussion, but um, I'll, uh, 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 I'll 
wait on that for now. Uh, what I was going to say was, first of all, thank you for bringing this to the IETF. I think it's very interesting. I, I look at it as a, possibly an exciting opportunity to never have to learn RTP. Um, and I'm, uh, I have a ton of questions about the, about the protocol and its, its uh, operational uh, behavior, especially uh, as used by apps and senders. But the one question I wanted to address first is, do you uh, view this as something that would, I think you said that it, right now it's used for uh, ingest and distribution. Um, do you see this as being uh, extended to deliver content to end users as well at some stage? And if so, kind of what's the, um, what's the, uh, I don't know, roadmap for, for getting there. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, so right now, SRT already supports it. Just the main, the major use case of it is live stream because there was an obvious need for some protocol that would address these issues. So I would say that SRT is very optimized for live streaming and it can be used for message exchange, user content delivery, and so on. Uh, just maybe some further improvements are required to, for example, improve congestion control for file transfer and, and, and so on. Sorry. Uh, so would that be, so does that include live streaming uh, to end users or, because the, the use of the pre-shared key, I, I agree, is going to be problematic if you're going to try to like, Add it as a browser protocol. So I assume that's one of the preconditions, but I'm not sure if there's others that you would also uh, need to do, or whether you've given any thought to using it in use cases beyond uh, just distribution, but into uh, into uh, end user delivery as well. Yeah, we do have on this thoughts. No clear roadmap so far, but of course we would like to address this uh, use case. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, I'm Mark from High Vision. Can I also answer this, or do I need to get in the queue? Uh, sorry, who is this? Mark uh, Zimankowski, High Vision. I'm I'm working with Maxime, and I would like to. Yeah, go ahead if you want to help answer. Thank you. Um, so the, the I would I would view it um, way similar to RTMP uh, of how it scales. Right? So the, it's it's optimal. The, why it was created is the contribution problem. How do you get it into the cloud from an on-prem location over the public internet, and how do you get it across? Um, but it um, it works uh, as a protocol similar to, to an RTMP. So if you have a server, an SMS server, and you contribute a stream into it, um, then obviously you can have hundreds or thousands of clients accessing that, depending on your server. Uh, capacity. However, it's uh, it's not a just since it's UDP based, it's not it's not directly in the browser, right? So it's a um, that's a limitation here. So when we're saying um, contribution and distribution, what that typically means is there's usually either a native software somewhere or a client that's receiving the stream and not directly the browser window. Thanks. Somebody's typing a bunch. Yes. Yeah. If you're not uh, speaking, could you uh, could you please mute so we don't get background noise? All right. Um, I guess since Spencer took himself out until the dispatch discussion, I guess I'm up next. So um, so taking off my chair hat for a moment, um, one of the things that I I think would help. Uh, would help people at the IETF understand the context for this work is um, is knowing a bit about about um, why you decided to uh, develop a new protocol rather than take an existing protocol or uh, you know uh, take an existing protocol as is or um, extend one to have some of the properties that you wanted. What what were the protocols that you looked at? um before developing this and why didn't they why didn't they measure up i think that i think that's basically what i'm under what, what, what i'm asking for 
Okay, is this Mark again? I would answer that because I that stupid idea. Um, <laughs> so back then in 2012, when I uh, when I joined High Vision at that point, I was asked for a solution um, to transmit low latency live streams over the public internet instead of over protected networks, what we were doing and being one of the leaders at that time, uh, as well as we are today. But um, so they they came to me and I had very little experience, to be honest, with networking. So I'm a pragmatic guy. Um, I came from computer vision and, and whatever. Ever. So I took, uh, I, I looked on the internet what I found and I, I found a protocol for, for very high throughput uh, for, for very high data transfer over the public internet, which was UDT, but it was designed for file transfer, uh, but it behaved very well on the network and I was able to utilize links at, at a maximum capacity, uh, but it was not designed to have a real-time behavior with end-to-end -end defined latency and encryption. Um, so I worked with the networking people in, in the company who helped me to at that functionality, like 10 years later or, or eight years later, um, with all the knowledge I learned and with all the networking that I do every day now, uh, I would probably have started back then with RTP, but that's just not the way it happened. That's basically why. Okay, I mean, I, I think that makes sense. It just, it, it just helpful for me for a historical context. Um, I mean, that seems reasonable. Um, all right, so next up in the queue is Glenn. Hey, there. hey so um, first, thank you for bringing this into the ITF um, via these presentations. I know it takes a lot of work and the ITF can be a little bit scary. Um, so thank you for, for doing both. Um, and, and, and I'll let you also comment, you know, so, you know, I'm from Comcast NBC Universal and we use this stuff um, in our uh, operations uh, uh, all the time, and so this is this is our reality of our media ops um, using SRT to you know haul our stuff around um, in, in our normal day to day work. So I, I'd like to see this you know succeed, um, and in particular, I'm encouraged by the the hope that um, the lessons that have been learned in other parts of the ITF around um, you know how to do connection IDs very efficiently and securely, uh, and also how to fold security into the protocols. Uh, like this uh, can be maybe applied and adopted by SRT uh, to make it even better than it is today. Um, so one question I do have though is, so where do you sort of see the, the priorities for SRT is, is uh, I mean, reliability of obviously delivery of packets is number one, especially for live media. You can't miss uh, the, the, the soccer uh, score goal or the hockey puck going into the net. That would be very, very bad. Um, and so that's a non-starter. Uh, what's, what's, sort of, what's sort of the next set of priorities for you? Is it, is it adding security features into it? Uh, is it is it encryption capabilities? Where, where do you where do you sort of see that going? Um, the the current priority is um, integrated. Um, what do we call connection bonding functionality to add redundancy, seamless switching as part of the protocol, as well as main backup failover functionality and balancing data over multiple links. Um, what you would need for say like a multiple bonded uh, or multiple um, 4G adapters or something to, to balance the data over the links. We, we, uh, that for us is something that has to be part of a contribution protocol um, and that's the top priority. Uh, the other priorities are looking at the security model and in addition to the pre-shared key, uh, can we, uh, for example, somehow adopt a DTLS model as a protocol or TLS model? Um, and that's, that's where we need, I mean, that's where we can need all the support we can get and all the help we can get. We are, we are very interested in because we know, especially in, in this community and, and in the wider community that that is a question that comes up obviously again and again and again. So I, I believe that those two are the key. And at the same time, we are putting a lot of research um, efforts into 
optimizing the congestion control algorithms um, to make it uh, friendly to the network and and optimal in its behavior. Um, that's that's been started probably like a year ago, and then we're making we're we're coming to the point where we have where we have good test environments and a good community, which is very important. So we can we can uh, invoke the community to help us evaluate those things and, and get feedback on it. Okay, I especially like the congestion control because you know one of the ongoing problems anybody has in pulling uh, video out of things like live sporting events is is the availability of very reliable high speed networks and and uh, things that work play well with the existing network are very welcome because they make everybody's lives easier. But thank you. Bye. Thank you, and and I'm also um, a little bit of moderating here. Um, we are as observed running low on time so at quarter past the hour we are going to move to our next large presentation and i will apologize in advance i skipped over glenn's update from simti but that's because i had heard previously that um, he hadn't extracted an update so we'll be doing that at our next meeting that agenda item is dropped um, so um, I would like to make sure that we have at most three more minutes discussion on this topic. I would sum up where we are at this point as there is interest in this protocol. There is in this group particularly interest around what it means for and what it can do for and how it does for video. Um, this is not the group that would work on the technical specification. Um, but maybe what we can do is take um, most of the rest of the discussion to the mailing list if the SRT proponents are willing to engage on the mailing list. That was a question directed at you folks. Yep. Totally fine. Okay, so the uh, the last one in the queue, it looks like, is Spencer. Yeah, and uh, without without wandering through dispatch very much, it seemed like the way that uh, discussion ended up was that you were going to be doing a draft describing what uh, SRT, SRT is now. Um, that, that's something that doesn't exist in a complete form quite yet. If I understood that correctly, that would that would help uh, MOPS discuss uh, SRT um, more effectively. So that sounds like a wonderful thing to have happen no matter what else happens with SRT and the IETF. All right, and that concludes the queue for this talk. Thank you, guys. And I guess uh, back to Leslie. Let me see if I can get my queue to behave this time. Uh, yeah, so, Jake, you are up. All right, thanks again, Leslie. Um, so this presentation, uh, the the in, the scope is uh, is in terms of uh, uh, engagement between uh, using MOPS as a venue for engagement between the operators uh, and looking for um, uh, it, it ends with a call for participation. So I'll keep that in mind. But I'll walk through a little. Um, uh, a little bit of uh, what I'm doing and where it's going. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so um, it kind of starts back in 2014. Uh, we had some plans, and they basically looked like this. And you get some multicast video to play, get the ISPs to deliver multicast and profit, right? Uh, next slide. So the real motivation here is that we could see the looming scalability issues that, that we've seen unfolding over the last several years and they're continuing to unfold. And the goal here is to capture um, uh, uh, the, you know, as a, as a way to solve this problem, multicast looks to us, it looked to us then and still looks to us now like we, like it's got a lot of potential there. Uh, so next slide. Please. <clears throat> um, 
So, you know, as, as time went forward, we fleshed that out a little bit and, uh, and a couple of pieces of this worked out great. Um, you know, we, uh, got the multicast video to play. It's working fine. Uh, we, um, you know, shipped a product. Uh, it's a walled garden video product and we first deployed it in, uh, 2019 Q1. Uh, customers are happy, they're expanding the deployment, um, but unfortunately it doesn't solve the scalability issues without uh, getting to that interdomain multicast piece, which is still an ongoing work in progress. Uh, but we're getting closer on that. So next slide, please. <clears throat> um, the attitudes that we've encountered for how to make this work, I, I think, are probably no surprise to anyone, but just to kind of summarize them, the the value proposition for multicast for multicast is clear. It's you know it's all about the scalability, um, in primarily for uh, for things that that can have uh, uh, that are accessed concurrently, um, and the viability of it is also clear, uh, in that it's you know deployed and running and works great um, where it is deployed and running. The, uh, it's it's commonly used for uh, set top box TV services, uh, and that's about it. Because really, um, because of the interop problem, which is that STB services and lab are basically the only two places that own, you know, all of the sender, the network, and the receiver in in one entity. Uh, and the cons here are, um, we think. The main reason that this hasn't taken off yet, uh, and the the you know the overriding one is that it's hard to make that business case when you don't know the cost and you don't know how much you're going to be able to save. And part of the reason that you don't know the cost and how much you're going to be able to save is because of the trickiness in the interop. And part of the risks are you know uh, this has been tried before and it was kind of an expensive failure to to get M1D uh, running last time. I mean, it's not exactly a failure, like it did some things, but it has not really realized its potential at this stage. And part of the reason is about this interop. Uh, you know, what we're trying to do is kind of address this. So next slide, please. <laughs> uh, so to summarize the discussion, has been, uh, you know, we're, we're, our vision here is that, well, AMT is, is a, a useful way to get this rolled out. Um, and so we, we started looking into that and that was in the uh, 2015 uh, timeframe. Um, and we're trying to make that uh, become viable. Uh, some of our early discussions with operators indicated that it's just not going to be um, possible to do it with, I mean, so it's it's no different from peering if you have to set up static IPs and a mapping with the with the static IPs. So uh, this is this resulted in uh, what's coming up. It's in off forty eight now. I, after this after this meeting, I'll probably go look at my latest round of, of responses if I've got them. Um, and uh, but but a way to discover it that can be uh, sort of individually deployed by by an AMT relay operator and can be discovered by uh, anybody with access to DNS is uh, is now a, at a proposed status standard uh, or proposed standard status uh, level uh, nearly captured as an RFC and um, you know among the problems uh, so one of my uh, first contributions at the IETF on this was uh, trying to, to understand, trying to get a handle on the way you can do rate limits because multicast doesn't build in any way to do that. And we're very concerned about the capacity um, of, uh, or how to um, make the, the, make it a manageable problem to ingest an unknown amount of capacity or what would otherwise be an unknown amount of capacity uh, into someone's network and, and make it safe. Uh, so this is one of the um, this is one of the issues we're trying to address. This is an ongoing conversation, not just the um, you know we're not we're not done yet, but this is kind of where things stand now and what it's looked like so far in you know a, a summary form. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, so our attempts to address the attitudes is to sort of you know, make the cost specific. Like, okay, here's some things. If you do these things, then we will have a viable architecture and it will actually work. And our efforts to address the unknown savings that you would get is to quantify, like, what are we going to actually be able to accomplish? And our estimates are coming up with uh, for Akamai traffic in terms of um, if we look at what all is addressable, what can we actually uh, uh, do if we have ubiquitous multicast deployment? Um, and we look at things that are kind of accessed concurrently. We think that we can ultimately get to 20% uh, of our day-to-day -day traffic and 50% of our peak traffic. Um, and, but furthermore, and maybe more importantly for uh, potential uh, ISP partners, is that we want our architecture to be repeatable by, by other operators so that when you get this all set up and make this work, then it's not just our traffic that you're going to be saving, but anybody who is able to sort of realize and take and make use of the same kind of, uh, the same kind of usage. And then as far as interop, then, I mean, we've got our sender. We are going to be spinning up a few different senders. Unfortunately, there's not like a really wide body of deployed functional uh, receivers that are able to receive like a standardized set of protocols, at least not yet. So what we're doing is um, for today's version, we have a, you know, a functioning Android uh, SDK that can be deployed in an in a app that can run on a set-top box or or uh, mobile phones, and you know we can integrate that. And the project that's underway now is to get a multicast API into a browser, and to start trying to upstream that API. But in the meantime, to run our SDK as a uh, as a web application within that those browser web pages, so that anyone with a browser is going to be able to start making use of of these uh, features if they are there. Um, and as we move that forward, then we're, uh, our intent is to get that upstreamed into, uh, into browsers, get it standardized by W3C and turned into a, an API that can be uh, actually used and, uh, and eventually to turn this into a standardized set of transport protocols that are widely available at receivers. But we have to sort of get this stage thing going in order to get anywhere. So this is where we are now. Partners for proof of concepts starting this year. So next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, so our our future plans at this point are that we want to, um, you know, on the uh, transport part, we want to expand our usage of multicast to be able to take care to to make use of uh, basically anything popular. That's what these these three use cases have in mind. Linear video is the one that we have running today. But we think that it's uh, addressable to access popular on-demand video. If you look at some of the major uh, on-demand video releases, even though they're released on-demand, it's very common that people are watching it within kind of the same half-hour slot. And so when you have a million users watching something in the same half-hour slot, it turns out that many of them are accessing things at essentially the same time. And so all you have to do is deliver a little bit of unicast, and then as long as they can buffer a little bit of multicast, then you know, there's no reason they can't be just accessing like two minutes worth of unicast instead of, you know, 60 minutes worth of unicast to watch that whole thing, or even just two minutes at a time. And the, the savings really add up when you try and address it that way. Uh, and, you know, additionally, the, the software download kind of use case, um, you know, games, uh, some of these games have, have 80 million active users that need, <laughs> and sometimes they need an update before they can log on again. You know, and that update sometimes is like 20, 40 gigabytes. And when you add that up, uh, those are the same bits going out to a lot of people. And uh, if you can deliver those with network replication, then you can really, really save a lot of money. Um, and so, uh, you know, our, our story here is that this is a win-win. This is, this is, if we can achieve peak 50% peak offload, and we think that other people in many cases can achieve a similar kind of offload, then, um, we would we think that there's a, a good win-win story here that that can reduce the infrastructure costs that uh, that ISPs are going to be faced with over time, and that by engaging now and getting this to move forward, that we can really get to a place that's that's useful. And meanwhile, we're also trying to get those receivers uh, deployed, and we're trying to just make this uh, an addressable problem. So, uh, yeah, next slide, please. 
so for um, for this year, what we're trying to do is get that browser API going. We have a dev team that's uh, begun work on it. Um, we're doing a few internal demos uh, still to try and get the make sure that we actually can can solve our use case. But I'm fairly confident that's going to succeed. Uh, so that is going to be like play video with our proposed API and make sure that our our WebAssembly SDK is going to do the job that we need it to do. Um, and as soon as we do that, our plans are to uh, to start trying to upstream that to declare a um, you know, an intent to implement or an intent to prototype, I guess it is now, uh, and to start folding in the the uh, the work that we're doing in M one D to make this something that's you know uh, reasonable to put into a browser because. Uh, one of the things that becomes immediately clear when you talk to browser developers is that they're highly aware of how malicious the web is. It's it's at a scale, you know, not not meant for mortals to understand really. Um, but uh, we, you know, the the two things that we're trying to prevent so far, we're not sure if it's going to be enough, but we think that it's a good start, and we think that they are a minimum set of what's necessary, uh, and we don't have other good ideas that that cannot be addressed by this yet. So we, we think this might be enough to get going and to kind of see operationally what we run into. Uh, and so that's, that is our intent. And the other intent for this year is to, uh, to begin to the extent possible some trials with carriers and make sure that the anti-ingest architecture that we're proposing is gonna you know, work for them to be, uh, to be usable and, and uh, get the job done for, uh, for getting multicast traffic you know, transported the places that it needs to get to, and, uh, and then to try to scale to uh, some real content that gets delivered. Um, uh, we're also partnering with some content owners. Uh, they're you know, not the ones that have to do as much work, so it's, it's not as hard a sell for them. Um, and uh, we would very much like to make sure that our, our proposed mechanism for uh, bandwidth controls will work with, the, with you know, some actual deployed systems that are used for bandwidth controllers. So we're, we're interested in, in tackling that problem. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so our, uh, our call for participation is, uh, you know, we're, we're in talks with, with a number of folks. Um, but in some cases, it's not like the people in our company that work with the CDN side of the uh, of the carriers are necessarily all the right people to be talking to. So if you know somebody in a carrier that you think would be interested in this, then then an introduction would be wonderful. Uh, or if you work at a carrier that might be interested in in exploring this and and capitalizing on those cost savings. Um, then uh, please do reach out to us. Uh, we would love to have a meeting to give you an architecture walkthrough and, and decide uh, after that, after you have time to look it over and get any questions you have answered, uh, whether this looks like something that you'd be interested in, in leaning into and, and figuring out. Uh, so, and, and we can um, make our, our overall estimates more specific to like the observed traffic that we've been sending into your network uh, to figure out, like, is this something that really makes sense for for what we typically deliver into your network, or is this something that that you know, just because of the way things are, aren't going to be that useful? Uh, and uh, yeah, so that that is what we're asking for. And please reach out if you have any uh, anything that you'd like to get more details on. And that's it. Thank you. All right, we are almost at the end uh, of the allotted time, but if uh, there are any questions uh, for Jake, please queue up. We'll go over a little bit if we have to. Uh, question, but I'll throw out uh, just how much it was interesting overview, um, current realities and, and that you're trying to tackle them with. All right. Thanks, Leslie. All right. Anyone? Anyone? Uh, general question Would we like to hear more about the progress from this? And um, Jake, would you like to send your invite to the mailing list as well to get broader reach? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can do that. Thank you.
hearing any further questions. Um, two items of AOB. One I had mentioned in the agenda, the liaison state we have from SE29 Working Group 11 to the ITF MOPS Working Group. I don't know if we have anyone on the call that can speak to that liaison. This is Spencer Dawkins. I talked to Stefan uh, and we, we had no, no further update at, at, as of Monday. I'll take that to the mailing list. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then the other, other AOB, um, Kyle alluded to earlier, and as did Jake, the, um, I guess Jake alluded to the Git repo that has been set up under the auspices of the ITF MOPS working group. Um, and Kyle is on the hook to share details of that with the working group mailing list. Um, presently. Yeah, uh, so we now have a, uh, we now have a, as Leslie mentioned, we have a, uh, a set of repositories, an area, whatever you want to call it, an organization on GitHub uh, for the MOPS working group. So uh, uh, when we adopt documents that are uh, that are uh, going to be managed through revision control, um, then we'll we'll move them into that uh, into that repo. I mean, just to be clear, that's not a not a requirement for adopting documents. We're not prescribing that everyone must use, uh, you know, that every uh, uh, document author must use GitHub, but it's, uh, but I, I encourage you to check it out if you haven't, because uh, it's a very good way for, uh, uh, for teams to collaborate on documents. I'll send out a, uh, the URL on the mailing list shortly. And that brings up the question, Eric, I'm not sure what, if anything, we have to do to coordinate with you for um, blessing or otherwise connecting the Git repo? I don't think so. That's mainly the working group chairs doing the work. And I think that we need to get a pointer to it on the charter page, but we can coordinate with you about that offline or maybe we can just edit that. I don't know. Yeah. Yes, with offline. Easier. Cool. Um, that was all I had for other other business. Does anybody else have any other 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 business? Not hearing any, um, I'll take the opportunity to thank everybody for coming out to the meeting, and certainly thanks to our presenters for sharing their work and and taking on questions. Um, I I <laughs> I expect that there will be more of these because I'm. Personally, fairly convinced the ITF won't be meeting face to face anytime soon. Um, so, if you have any feedback on things that worked well in this meeting, things that could have worked better, or other areas you'd like us to tackle in future virtual events, do please share with the MOPS dash chairs at ITF.org, Kyle and I. Um, I would uh, take any, any and all feedback, especially constructive feedback. Anything else, Kyle? Uh, no, I think I think we're all set. Just make sure that you uh, make sure you all sign the uh, the blue sheets, the virtual blue sheets in the uh, in the Etherpad. I also wanted to say that you all are getting nice comments in the uh, WebEx chat, which are going to go away when the conference ends. So I wanted to let the chairs appreciate that while it lasts. Well, we very we much. appreciate that. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.